Welcome to Secrets from the Scene, a show for local musicians who want to improve their music, grow their audience, and learn about Minnesota's music scene. If you're interested in talking about all things music related and meeting interesting people from our local community, you're in the right place. Welcome to Secrets from the Scene. My name is Stephen Helvig and I'm your host. On today's episode, I'm joined by Max Green. Max is an engineer here at Helvig Productions. He's been my right-hand man for four and a half years or so, um, and also hosted a recent episode with The Drum Doctor. We're going to talk about seven common mistakes that bands make at their gigs and how you can avoid them. Some of the stuff you might be currently doing, and there's easy ways to get around it. Some of it maybe you've done in the past, and now you know better. Either way, these are all things that we've both seen plenty of times, and it's okay if you find that you maybe fall into one of these things. They're just things to think about and to be aware of that you can probably do better. Now, some of these things are to help you from looking unprofessional. Some of these things are to help you just simply be more efficient, whether that means saving time, working less with load in and load out, playing a better gig, you know, sounding better, having better relationships with everybody that you're working with from your bandmates, the other bands that are playing with you to the staff that are at the venue and more. So they help you in different ways, but they're all super important. I'm excited to get into them. If this is your first time joining us, thank you so much. This is a podcast for local musicians. So if you fall into that camp, check out the other episodes. There's tons of information from playing live to navigating the recording process, marketing, branding, all kinds of stuff. So thank you for joining us. And if you're a repeat listener, we very much appreciate you. All right, let's get into it. Mistake number one, Max. Mistake number one is failure to communicate with the venue. All right. Talking with the venue and the venue staff, you're kind of setting the tone and you're kind of putting a picture in the venue's mind. Like, is this going to be a, these people going to take this seriously? Are they professional or is this just another local band, amateur kind of show? Like you, this is kind of where you can really kind of set the tone. Obviously you would have communicated to some degree to get the, to get yeah. it, right? So we're not saying, yeah. you know, absolute failure to communicate. It's are you doing enough? Are you getting all the information that you need and are you doing it well? Mm -hmm. You know, we talked before that a lot of this episode really is like, if you want to be treated professionally, you need to act professionally. Yeah. Regardless of whatever the circumstances are, because there's going to be a lot of people listening to this that have very different perspectives, right? Depending on where you're at in your career and yeah. how professional the venues you are playing at mm -hmm. are. But either way, all this stuff is, is useful information to know. So what do we mean by communicating with the venue? Ultimately, it's about getting all the information and making sure they have all the information that's yeah. necessary too. Everything is sorted out beforehand, so there's no like gray area. And one of those things that's common that gets lost sometimes is a stage plot. If you have never used one, if you don't know what one is, we will link one in the show notes. Max, you said there's like a website. Yeah, there's... If you just type in like stageplotdesigner.com and basically if you don't know what a stage plot is, it's just a map of the stage. It has whatever gear that you're going to be using. Input and list. It, your input list, whatever gear you're going to be using, who's on what side of the stage, how many guitars you have, a bass, if there's keys, if there's backing tracks. How many vocals you yeah. need. Yeah. It's just like a map that you give to the sound person. And it makes their life a lot easier. Because now they know, oh, I need 16 inputs for this band. Yes. Or I need four inputs for this band. That's a very different preparation for them. So you're communicating that ahead of time. And it forces you to know. Like Sometimes you might, like, yeah, we all have a vocal mic, but this person is only going to sing on one song. Yeah. Well, they're going to be the first person to get cut if they don't have a big enough input list for this. Again, this is going to be venue dependent. Mm-hmm. Even if the venue doesn't ask for this ahead of time. You should su supply it anyways. Still supply it because it forces you to get organized. Of This is how we are going to set up. This is where we're going to stand. This is the stuff we're going to bring. The next point is load in and parking. Yeah, figure out way beforehand where the venue is, what the traffic is going to be like, and then where the venue wants you to load in. Sometimes 
there's a weird alleyway in the back that it's only a one way. And, you know, sometimes there's specific directions that you need. And if you show up late to the gig and you don't know this information beforehand, it can make your sound check late. It can delay everything. So it's like figure out where the venue is, where the load in spot is, where they want you to park. Yeah. They're going to tell you what time they expect you to show up to the venue to start sound check. So during that communication, just ask, where do you suggest we park and what is the best way to load in? Yeah. Cause, cause nothing's worse than when you show up and then one band member asks a venue staff, where do we park? And then five minutes later, another venue or another band member walks in and asks the same question. It's like, figure that out beforehand, communicate that with the rest of your band. Makes things smoother. Avoid parking tickets, avoid getting towed. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing will ruin a gig quicker than getting towed. And the venue will have a preference on that and have advice. So, And sometimes they have designated parking for artists True. that's free. Or if you have a van and a trailer or something, they'll have a specific spot so that way you don't have to pay for parking. Or if you're in a city with a van and trailer, it can be kind of a pain to, to do that. So just the more you can figure that out beforehand, the easier life's going to be. Next thing is figure out the payment and how they plan on ticketing the event or if there's a door charge or however they plan on doing that. Just get that figured out beforehand. Most venues will communicate that with you, but if they don't, just make sure that that's all sorted out. You want to make sure you get paid. Make sure those terms are clear. Like when are we being paid? How is that calculated? You want all that in writing anyway. So when you're back and forth with the venue, just make sure that's all spelled out and clear. Yeah. And sometimes there could be something unusual, you know, about how that goes. So you don't want to have any surprises when you show up. So just try to get everything spelled out right away. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. And sometimes when you're just starting out and you're playing more smaller venues that are a little bit more, you know, maybe one person is running the bar and is also booking the bands and is also doing the door and doing 500 tasks. Sometimes they might not be super organized with that. Sometimes they might not even mention the ticketing or money or any of that kind of thing. So it's like, you know, investigate that beforehand. So that way, well, maybe this isn't a place we want to play, or maybe they don't collect all the money the way that they say they're going to collect, or maybe we need to supply a door person for this specific venue so that we can have... This is really a note for smaller venues because anybody yeah. that's mid-sized or larger is is going to handle this. But there are, as you're starting off, and a lot of listeners are just getting started, you might play a venue here in town that like, they would love if you helped take tickets at the door. Yeah. <laughs> and having that communication ahead of time might be important. So another point that you need to sort out ahead of the show are the time slots. If you've got a bill with, let's say, four or five bands playing that night, you need to come to an agreement with the venue as to how long each set is, what the gaps are in between the sets, what they expect and what you expect, that everybody's on the same page. That way you can relay it to the other bands and prepare accordingly because this this affects sound check often and it might affect load in times. Sound check's probably going to happen in a specific order. And based on that, you might stagger the load in. Everybody might show up at the same time, but you may not be able to park in the same place to load in. So you might need to stagger that. So just being as detailed about that as you can will just help make things a little smoother. Because ultimately something's going to go wrong. Someone might be late. You know, there can always be some sort of variable. So the more stuff that you can have figured out beforehand, just the easier it'll be the day of the show. Yeah. The last point that we have in terms of like common failures of communication with the venue is talking about backline. Some venues provide some elements of backline or a full backline. So you need to know that ahead of time. If you're going to use the house drum kit, for instance, there are venues in town that provide that. And if they don't, is everyone in the band going to bring their own? Are you going to share? Are you essentially going to have your own provided backline for that show? This kind of leads into our next point, but that's something you need to talk to the venue about right away to find out what they have, Yeah. Does it fit your needs? Are you going to use it? Yeah. Because just because they have a drum kit, well, does that mean it's a functioning drum kit? You know, I've I've done shows where, oh, they have a backline kit and then you show up and the hi-hat stand doesn't work and this doesn't work. So it's good to maybe bring like some backup stands or a backup chair or a couple things. But yeah, if you can avoid having five bands bring five drum sets, great. 
if you can avoid bringing a bunch of extra amps, great. It just saves stage space and it can make the transition times a lot faster. But yeah, definitely something to communicate with them. Like, all right, so you have a backline kit. What is it? And then maybe have some some backup stuff ready just in case some of their stuff isn't the best to work with. Definitely. All right, we're on to the second mistake. It's really like a category of mistakes, but the second thing is then a failure of communication with your other bands or the other people that are on this bill. As we just talked about, we'll start with the gear, the backline thing, because this this ties in with that. If there's a backline, that needs to be communicated. And if there's not, what are you going to share or not share? Yeah. Try to bring as little stuff as possible. It makes the the time in between sets faster, which is better for everybody. Yeah. And it's easier on the sound guy to not have to re-mic everything. Sometimes there's a reason to switch things out. Yeah. I get it. And if that's the case, that's the case. But if there's not a good reason, yeah. then do what you can to share stuff. And especially like with drummers, you don't always need to have your kit for the gig. You don't, you know, if if the rest of the bands have the same similar kind of setup as you, use their kit. You know, it's you don't always need to have your specific stuff. Sometimes you just have to kind of be flexible and work with if someone else is bringing a bass amp, maybe just be flexible and use their bass amp. You don't always need to have your own thing if it's not absolutely necessary to your to your sound. Particularly the more bands that are sharing a show. Yeah. If there's just two bands on, then fine, so yeah. be it. But if it's a five, but six yeah, band bill. If there's five, then no. Just, just make share some stuff. compromises, yeah. Another major point with communication with the other bands is how are you going to promote the show? There needs to be dialogue on this. A lot of it's implied. Of course, we're going to promote it. Of course, we're going to share it on social media. But talk it through. Make sure expectations are are set so that they can actually yeah. be met. A lot of times someone will make like an event page on Facebook or something. If you do that, communicate that with the other bands and then send them an invite so that they can be a co, I don't know what it's called, like a co- Collaborator. Collaborator or whatever. So that they don't make a whole separate page, event page, and then invite people, you know, communicate. All right, we'll take care of making this Facebook page. Can you guys and this other band make a flyer or just- be aware so that way there's not five different flyers for the show and there's not, yeah, five, you know, make posts or videos or content together. I love that. I yeah. mean, we see more of that now, collaborative posts, collaborative content. I think it's a great way to generate excitement and to also just build your network and community with your friends yeah. that you're going to be playing with. You, yeah, especially if you've never played with these people before, it can be a little, you know, a good way to break the ice a little bit, you know, introduce yourself, the members in your band get to know the people's names before the show. So that way when you're not showing up, it's not, hi, I'm Jack, I'm Todd. Oh, we've been talking in this group chat for a month and a half. It's like, you know, get that out of the way beforehand. It just makes everybody more comfortable. It makes every, break the ice a little bit more beforehand. And, and you can have a lot of fun too with creating promo content together. You can get really creative. And I've seen a lot of really cool videos and like fun videos that is more than just Come see my band play at this place, you know. Now that you have the set times and the order and everything else from the venue, you can relay that information to the bands you're playing with. Make sure everybody understands how long they're expected to play, what the order is, that everybody's on the same page, so that, again, you're not just doing that at the time of the show. The reason being is that maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe these are all people you're friends with, and all of this could just be winged, and it's a venue you, you've been at before, and it's all fine to just do it last minute. I get that. But what'll happen is at some point, something's going to go wrong or somebody's going to have different expectations and just be having a bad day already. And then maybe what isn't a big deal to you is a big deal to somebody else. So you want to do this all plenty ahead of time of the show so that none of this comes up and goes badly right before the show. Because that just kind of sets a bad energy, bad tone for the rest of the night. Yeah, that kind of goes into the the next little bullet point of talk about payment and how that's going to work with the other band. So let's say you're the headlining band or whatever. Be very clear on how payment is going to work. Maybe some bands might be getting paid less than others, or there might be different splits depending on 
if they're playing a shorter time slot and they're the op- they're the opener or you know whatever the circumstance may be just be very clear so that way it's not at the end of the night or whatever oh we'll send you the money a couple days from now on venmo send me your venmo get the venmos beforehand get the payment details laid out clear so nobody's questioning oh did they rip us off did they pay us less than we were supposed to oh there was a lot more people in the audience than what it seems like we're being paid for, you know, like just be very clear on how payment's going to work. Be very clear on how you're going to send the payment. Be very clear who's going to send the payment to who. If it's, you know, the headlining band sending it to the other bands, just get that stuff squared out beforehand. And it just saves a lot of confusion and awkwardness after the fact. Definitely. Every city is a small town, you know, in that sense, yeah. like everybody knows everybody. And word will travel if you don't handle these things well. Yeah. Good intention or not, you don't want that. So just be as clear as you can. And I mean, basically both these two big points, communicating with the venue, communicating with other bands on the bill, it's all communication stuff. Just being as diligent as you can with Mm -hmm. all your details so that when you show up, you don't have to worry about these problems anymore. For sure. All right. I think we're on to our third big category point, the load in. Now, <laughs> you would think, how can you mess this up? But you definitely can mess this up. You definitely We can. alluded to needing to know like where to park, when to show up, like take time to account for traffic and the lack of parking sometimes if there isn't a designated spot so that you're on time. That's the big thing for load in. And is everybody showing up at the same time or is it going to be staggered to some degree? Because if, yeah. if load in is kind of a limited one little door in a small one-way alley, it might make sense to try to stagger it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing you see the most, and it's kind of comical almost, is like people just not having a system for load-in where they're literally bringing in like every individual piece of gear. They've got a cable wrapped around their arms. There's no cases for things. And it's just like, yeah, it just, this is amateur hour. You got cardboard boxes with stuff. You don't, it's just stuff on wrapped cables all over, people coming in, taking 15 different trips back and forth. Have a system for how you load in. Have stuff organized. Have stuff in cases. Have stuff as efficient as it can be to make your load in process as fast as it can be. There's on Amazon, you can get a little like industrial foldable cart, fit in your trunk, you can take it out, pop it up, put all your gear on that, load it in, maybe take two or three trips versus 17 trips. Super great for drummers or if you have a lot yeah. of merch and stuff like that. Yeah. Heavy amps. And okay, everybody's at a different stage. If yeah. you're just playing, you maybe I don't want to buy a car, I don't, you know, whatever. But at least get like a duffel bag or get a Rubbermaid yeah. bin for $8, you yeah. know, like throw things in that. Don't have miscellaneous items. A, it looks, it just looks amateur, but, yeah. but B, it, you're so much more likely to lose that thing after yep. the gig, you know, having it packed up in a certain way will allow you to take up less of a footprint when you get in. Cause that's the other downside of doing it this mm-hmm. way is that you just have gear sprawled all over. And if there's, again, there's four bands loading in that just becomes a mess really, yeah. really quick. Keep your stuff in a tight area. Know where the venue wants you to actually load it in and how they want you to load in so you can be respectful of how they want it to be done. And it'll just go faster and it'll look better and you will likely not lose anything in the process. And sometimes with load-ins, like depending on the venue that you're at, sometimes you know, you're not in the greatest area or you know, you're loading in through a sketchy alleyway. And so that door that you load in locks. And if you got to take 15 trips back and forth, and I have to have somebody from the venue let you in and out every time. It just becomes a pain in the ass after a while. And, you know, if you're in a venue where you got to climb a bunch of stairs, do you really want to bring a drum kit up and down the stairs and do all this stuff, you know? So it's like the more efficient you can be and the more compartmentalized you can be. Like you can go to Costco and get these big ass plastic, heavy duty weather tech bins for $8 a piece. You could fit, you know, your pedal boards in there. You could fit your cables. You could fit your merch in there and, you know, have a system, have it labeled. Just make it more efficient. Yeah. And then what you were saying about having a smaller footprint. If you're playing with four or five bands and there's it's a smaller venue, nobody wants to have the whole back hallway of the the venue filled with four or five drum kits all spread out and guitars everywhere and gear everywhere and 
unopened cases everywhere. You know, sometimes like that, the place where you store the gear is on the way to the bathroom. Do you think all the people in the venue want to be shuffling around all your gear just to get to the bathroom? No. Compartmentalize it, create a small footprint, and just be aware of the situation and be aware of where you're storing your gear and try to be out of the way with your gear and with your cases and that kind of thing. Yeah. Another note on loading in is help each other. Help other bands, but help your other bandmates. I mean, how many times do you see jokes about like the singer not helping with oh, load in and stuff like that? Some people prefer to handle their own gear. And I get that. There are reasons, I think, especially with load out uh, to do it yourself. But if you're not helping with gear, there's probably something else you can help with. Whether you're the person that's holding a door or if you don't have gear yourself, maybe you're the one who's dealing with the merch. But try to help each other out. Don't just sit around. Just because you're downloading your and your stuff doesn't mean Loden's done. There's other bands. It'll make their day. It'll really help build a relationship. If, hey, is there anything I can help with? You, you know, that, that amp looks heavy. You want me to grab the other side of it? It just helps the morale and it helps the whole show move along. Because the sooner everyone else is loaded in, the sooner everyone can sound check. And, you know, so just help other people out. Yeah. And that gets us to our fourth major point, which is the sound check. Sound check can be tough, depending again on the venue and how pro that is and, and how comfortable everybody is with it. This can go really smoothly. It can be really rough, but there's a few things I think that can help make it go as successfully as possible. The first thing is just be ready to go, be ready to set up so that you can get set up quickly when it's your time to sound check. The quicker you get set up, the more time you actually get. To, yes. to test levels. Yes. Yeah. So with, with that, know when your sound check time is and then, all right, this other band sound checking and we're up next. I'm going to go grab my gear and set it off to the side of the stage. So that way, as soon as they're done, I'm not scrambling, trying to go find my gear. I'm ready to go. I can help them take their gear off or move their gear back or whatever and pop my gear on and we can start our sound check. It's just be ready it'll save you time. It'll give you more time to sound check. Yeah. When you get set up, get the band set up as quickly as possible and then have a song prepared. Have a song that you always do for your sound check. This song should be a good representation of your sound and it should also utilize every member. So if yeah. you've got multiple vocalists, for instance, you want to do a song where they all sing so you yep. can sound check one thing. Or if you need to make a song that's your sound check song, do that. Yeah, But that way everybody gets to hear what they need to hear because it's not helpful if you're the background singer and you don't sing on the song to sound check that song. Yeah, Or if you're the guitarist and you need to sound check multiple tones, make sure you're using a song where you're going through those tones yeah. so you know that your lead tone and your rhythm tone are matched. Yeah, I think that's very, very important. Play a song that is the loudest and most ripping that it's going to be and then maybe it has more of the quieter, different tones if there's multiple singers have them all sing on it. It'll help the sound person a lot too, because if you sound check with a really mellow song, then they're not getting an accurate representation of what, what your sound is. And right. So, and, and it doesn't even need to be a full song. It could be just a chorus or a chorus and a verse of something that has two different choruses really popping and the verse is really mellow and you just loop that over and over again. But as long as it gives the sound person and yourselves an accurate representation of what your overall sound is, it'll, it'll make your life a lot easier. The other thing is how you set up and getting your like stage volumes. I think the very first thing you do, cause it's, it's not that helpful if you just plug in and then, Hey, give me these things like that can work, but you kind of need it in context. Right. Yeah. And so I think one of the first things you want to do is get everybody playing at the level they're going to be playing at. So I've said this in plenty of other episodes, but I think one of the biggest mistakes people make when it comes to sound check specifically is just having their stage volume way too loud. Yeah. So when you sound check, try to get it like, obviously you have to be a certain level to just deal with the drums, to deal with live drums, mm -hmm. but try to keep your stage volume as low as possible before the monitors are even on and get the amps set up far enough away from you and pointing up a little bit so that they can act as a monitor and give everybody on stage a little bit of the natural sound before monitors are even on. Yeah. Because then if you know, like, what's most important to me, what are the one or two things I absolutely need to hear to play this gig? If the stage volume is nice and balanced before the monitors are even turned on, when it comes to sound check, what do you need in your monitor? You just start with the things that you need. 
Yeah. Instead of everything, start with the things that you need because you're getting natural stage sound already. Mm -hmm. And then you can slowly add in more and more and more. Again, depending on the size of this stage, the size of this venue, the, how many monitors there are on all these things, you can get pickier. Yeah. But a lot of local musicians don't get that kind of opportunity, that kind of experience. The big thing is the vocals. A lot of times the vocalists, like I can't hear myself sing. And if the vocalists can't hear themselves sing and they're not any good on stage, the whole show kind of goes to shit. Yeah. So knowing that like, you know what, if the amps are kind of all pointed in a little bit and up, we can have a really low stage sound and I'll probably be able to hear everything I need between the guitarists and the drums. But there's maybe there's no keyboard amp. Okay, I know I need to have keys in my monitor and I know I need to have my vocal, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And as long as nothing else is going into that monitor yet, you'll be able to get enough of it. If your stage volume is low, you will be able to get enough of it. Yep. The reason why it happens that you can't get enough or they like, I've asked and they can't turn it up is because you're already, everybody's too loud. Mm -hmm. Everything's maxed out. They can't get that stage floor wedge any louder yeah and so it's just on you it's not the sound person you have to start as quiet as possible and then only use the stuff that you need And if you do those things the rest will come will fall into place yeah the sound person knows the room the sound person knows has a good mental picture of how loud things should be or shouldn't be so ask them you know before anything's mic'd up hey can you listen and just see if our guitars are even with each other because if one guitar amp is way louder than the other one, you're going to have a, a battle that you're fighting, you know? Can you just stand out and listen, make sure our, our stage volume between the amps are even and, and quiet enough and let us know if our stage volume is too loud. Uh, as a drummer too, like sometimes if you're playing in a smaller venue, ask the sound guy like, hey, just let me know if I'm way too loud or if you need me to, to back off a little bit or play a little quieter because... If you're in a small room, you know, you can just blow people's heads off. And if, if the drums and cymbals are blaring, then the guitar players are going to be want to be louder and the bass gonna, and everything's going to want to be louder. So just ask the sound person, how loud should we be? And don't be afraid to let us know if something is too loud or the stage volume is too loud or if we need to back off a little bit or yeah. dial something down a little bit. I agree with all of that. But the reality is, is sometimes you're the second band on and there is not going to be that kind of, you know, there wasn't a sound check or whatever. And like... You don't get to do that for sure. Or the sound person is not interested in communicating <laughs> yeah. on that level. That's why I go back to just the philosophy of we're going to point our amps up for ourselves and we're going to point them in because then just like when you're practicing at home or in your rehearsal space, because then if your amp is as low as it can be for you to hear it and it's your personal monitor, you can play the gig, right? Mm -hmm. And if the other, if there's another guitarist, they do the same, they can do the gig. Let's say they're not perfectly matched. That shouldn't matter because at that point, the sound yeah. guy can turn them up. Yeah. He can turn one of them up or both of them up. Yeah. If you start with, it only needs to be this loud, then you give them room to actually fix things. Exactly. Yeah. But if they're already too loud, now there's you, no now there's back, nothing yeah. that can, they can do. So yeah. except keep turning everything up, which generally leads to feedback and more problems. So, yeah. And another thing is, Know what you absolutely need to hear to perform your best, to play the best. If you're the singer and you need the vocals, have the vocals be the loudest thing and everything else be a little bit quieter. You know, know what you absolutely need. Be stingy on everything else because in a perfect world, you have this great mix on stage and everything is great. It's rare. But it's rare. It really is. Until you get to a certain level where you're dealing with like in-ear monitors and somebody yeah. actually mixing the, the stage monitor mix for you. Yeah. You know, you get what you get and you need to be okay with that. And you need to be ready for that to still put on a hell of a show, regardless of how it sounds on stage. Yeah. Because what it sounds like on stage is never what it sounds like out in the audience. Yeah. And so you just need to make sure that you have what you need. Yeah. And then you can slowly add some stuff in there towards the end of the sound check. Hey, by the way, I will take a little bit of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. A and, tiny bit. And that way too, like depending on what venue you're doing and depending on how good or bad the sound person is, if they're not the best sound person, you don't really have to worry. Like I know, all right, I just need to hear myself and vocals to get through the day. doesn't matter how good the sound person is. As long as I have these two things, I'll be all right. I play with, with in-ears a lot and all I have in my in-ears is a click track and a little bit of uh, the guitars and a little bit of bass. Very, very quiet, mostly click track and, and a lot of vocals because that's all I need. Everything else is just kind of extra. And then I know no matter what, I have what I need to play 
And yeah, you'll be able to get through the show and you won't be clouded with all this extra stuff and it won't be just a muddy mess flying in your face. Let's take a minute to talk about our sponsor, Helvig Productions, which just so happens to be my studio. Are you a musician here in the Twin Cities, currently releasing music and ready to upgrade your sound? If you're tired of underwhelming recordings and want a polished, professional sound that gets people talking, we're here to help. We'll work with you to transform your next song into a production that feels impeccable, gets your friends singing along, and catches the attention of your soon-to-be new fans. And here's my guarantee. Give us seven days to deliver a mix you love, or we'll keep working for free until you're 100% satisfied. If that sounds compelling, here's how it works. First, we'll start with a pre-production analysis where we focus on the core of everything, the songwriting and arrangement. We'll give you an honest outside perspective to make sure your song is on track for the sound you want. And if it needs a few tweaks, we'll give you some tips and work with you to make improvements. If you want a deeper writing collaboration, we can bring in a specialized songwriter to assist. Either way, you keep full ownership of your music no matter what. Once that's locked in, we'll jump into the professional recording and production process. This is where we capture the best performance of each part from start to finish. We'll handle everything from detailed recording to expert vocal production, editing, tuning, mixing, and mastering, plus all our best production assistants along the way. We've got top-notch gear, a great live room, and most importantly, over 15 years of experience helping artists get their best performances. This process has helped our clients build real fan bases and even land on Spotify playlists. We've got the results to back it up. Sharkoff built a fan base from scratch with over 99,000 YouTube subscribers and over 60 million views across platforms. Silver Warehouse got their very first single playlisted by Spotify, racking up over 3 million plays. Waltzing on Waves had a song from their debut album playlisted on Spotify, amassing 2 million plays. Ludwig landed sync deals with brands like Hyundai and shows like All American. And we've got over 80 five-star reviews on Google. So if that's all you need to hear and you're ready to chat, head to helvicproductions.com slash let's connect or click the link in our show notes. We'll have you fill out a quick questionnaire. And if we're not a match, we'll let you know up front. We only work with clients who are a strong fit for our strengths because we're not satisfied until you are. If this sounds good to you, click that link and let's get started. I'm excited to see what we can create together. All right. I think we're on to point number five, general etiquette. And this is just your behavior once you show up to the venue all the way to when you leave. Don't be an asshole. Realize that the people that are at the venue are at their jobs and they're trying to get their jobs done. So be respectful of them and be respectful of the space that you're sharing with other people. Yeah. It might be a hobby or a fun thing you do on the side, but to the venue and to the people that work there and to some of maybe some of the other bands, it is their job. It is something they take very seriously. And if you're just kind of not professional or acting professional, it just it looks bad and no one's going to want to work with you again. Don't be loud. Don't be obnoxious. Don't be rude. Say thank you. Say please. Call people by their names. Get out of the way when you need to get out of the way. Don't treat this like your personal playground. Yeah. You know, I think I, <laughs> I've seen this, I've, you know, in, in, in bands. I know you have, Max, like where it's like, it's exciting, right? You get to feel like a rock star for a second and you, you get there, you start fucking around. I'm not saying don't have fun. Like this is music. Yeah. This is rock and roll. Like enjoy yourself, but just be aware of the situation. Make sure that, that what you're doing at the time is okay. Cause you might think in your mind that, oh yeah, no, we're, we're having a great time. Everybody's having a good time. And the bar staff or the yeah. dorm person is not. And if it's, yeah, if it says no smoking or vaping in the green room, don't smoke weed and rip bongs and vapes <laughs> in the green room. It pisses the venue staff off. They obviously have it for a reason. If it says don't bring in outside alcohol into the green room, don't bring in outside alcohol in the green room. The venue staff will see it. They'll see your empty beer cans in the garbage can. They'll get pissed off and they'll never want you there. They have these rules and these things in place for a reason. A lot of times the doors where you load in or backstage say, keep this door shut. For whatever reason, you know, if, if it's so that they can stop outside people from coming in or for whatever reason, keep the door shut. Don't just ha have it open, bring in your gear in and out, letting friends in and out. It just looks bad. It looks unprofessional. Just do what they say and be professional. Other stuff in this general etiquette category includes, I think, kind of common decency things like watch the other bands, you know, 
you don't have to sit through every single minute of every other set. You have other things going on. You probably have people showing up that you need to talk with. I get that. But yeah. try to at least show some FaceTime for all the bands. Be supportive. Show up. And then call them out. Like if yeah. they played before you, thank them. You know, call out the other bands that played. I think that's fairly common, but not always. But it goes a long ways to to building your community and keeping a really good reputation with everybody. Yeah. And make sure that they um, see you watching them too. Go to the front of the crowd and stand there and cheer them on. You know, it means a lot to people when they see, all right, this other band has our back. This other band is supporting us. They're cheering for us. They're trying to hype up the crowd. They're trying to start a mosh pit, whatever. It means a lot to them. If you're just sitting in the green room the whole time and, you know, not engaging or whatever, people can see that. They can see right through that and they can see these people don't care about us. This other band only cares about themselves. It's just kind of rude, you know? Show you don't have to like you said, you don't have to watch their whole set. But just be out in the crowd. Give them give them a couple whoop whoops, you know, hype them up, show support. Hey, great set. I really love that guitar solo you did on that second to last song that'll mean the world to the other bands that you're playing with and maybe you're a, a fairly you know big band or you're trending up you got a lot of people coming you're headlining the show and you just don't want to be out in the crowd because that means you're gonna to have to do a lot of talking and whatever and you, you don't want to show up i get that then just be supportive in other ways if you're yeah. not going to be there for the band then you know hey i could hear it from backstage and it sounded great Whatever, just try to be polite and respect yeah. that people are here to help you out too and be a, a supportive member of the musical community. It's really yeah. what it comes down to. Another thing would be to, along those lines, respect your time slot. If you're an opening act, don't go over. Be ready to go when it's your turn and only play as long as it was allotted for. Now, shows often get pushed back and run late. And if that's the case, you you go with it, you know, obviously, but just don't be the reason it gets pushed back. I was in a band a few years ago where we mostly played smaller local bar shows and where it was there was room for flexibility and a 45 minute set didn't necessarily mean hard cut off at 45 minute sets. And so we kind of got used to that. So then eventually we got a lot bigger opportunity to open up for a lot bigger band, very, very professional environment playing in front of a very large crowd and we had a 45 minute time slot and in our minds that was oh 45 minutes of music and that is not the case so if you get an opportunity to play a bigger scale thing your time slot means your load in time to onto the stage your set time that you play and then your load in time off of the stage so just be aware of the type of gig you're playing and the situation and know like is this a hard cutoff or is this loose? Yeah, generally those the set times get a lot stricter the higher profile gigs you get. And yeah, if, and, and we we thought that forty five minute time slot was forty five minutes of music, and we went over, and the sound guy had to cut us off, and the stage crew and the stage manager was really pissed off because they're on a schedule. They are on a if it's a larger scale thing, they they have a system. Everything is to the T, and if you're that amateur local band that opens up the show and goes over the time slot it just it looks bad and it throws everything else off and delays everything else so just be aware of the situation too yeah and to help you know at, at a local show where let's say that's not necessarily the case and maybe there's okay this went over a little bit or whatever that's fine it doesn't have to be a big deal nobody needs to be like you know yeah. ultra strict about it it's fine but but then, you know, if we know we're running behind and we want to catch back up, help people take the stuff off, you know, yeah. you can give each other a hand. You should, you should always do that. That's, it's annoying for the venue and the, the other bands. If change over times is 25 minutes, you know, help the other bands take their gear off. Hey, great set. Can I grab some stuff for you? Sure. You know, make it as quick as of a changeover as it can be. It'll make the night move along faster people will be grateful that you're helping them take their stuff off and it'll just keep things on track. Like if you want to lose an audience fast, have a 20 minute changeover time. People are going to be bored and want to move on to something else. But if it's a quick changeover, music's constantly happening, it'll be a lot more entertaining and for the audience and it'll just make everything better and the whole show as a whole be better. Moving on to point number six, I have two points left. The sixth major mistake that bands make at their gigs is just poorly run merch booths. 
it kind of feels like there's so much, I mean, already we've discussed so much that goes into just getting the show to happen that merch can feel a little bit like an afterthought, but it's super important in terms of your profit margin. Sometimes like that can be where you're really making money. Yeah. Depending on the size of the show, having a poorly run merch booth means you're probably not making as much money as you could otherwise. Yeah. It's like when you go to a concert and you look at the merch booth, what do you see? You see they have a merch person. They have all of the shirts or whatever laid out and displayed neatly. They have a little card reader so you can take cards. They have a little cash lockbox so you can pay cash. It's efficient. It looks nice. It's presentable. And they have somebody running it. If you just show up with a cardboard box full of wrinkly t-shirts and a couple stickers that you just slap on a table and you have nobody running your merch booth, no one's going to buy your merch. Have one of your friends run the merch booth, have a nice little QR code, have a nice little printed out sheet that says the prices, buy a little mini t-shirt rack that you can have one of your t-shirts on display that looks nice, and you'll sell a lot more merch. And then when you sell merch, have it organized, have it the shirts rolled up with a rubber band and the size on a little sticker on it. So if someone buys an extra large t-shirt, you're not sitting there for five minutes digging through a crusty cardboard box looking for an extra large t-shirt. Have one ready to go. And then keep an inventory list. If you sell X amount of t-shirts, mark off which ones you sold and then what size they're in. It doesn't have to be a wild operation, but just the more organized you are with it and the more professional you are with it, the more merch you'll sell and just the better it looks for your band too. Agreed. A lot of it comes down to efficiency because sure, there might be an appearance thing as you said, like, well, that all looks terrible and I'm not even interested in going to check out that table. I think if your display looks great and you've got good lighting, you've got good signs and stuff, that does help people sell. But let's let's assume that I actually think the bigger problem comes in that I don't want to wait forever. Yeah. And so like your band just crushed it and I'm I want to go buy something. And so does everybody else at this venue. And now mm -hmm. there's 25 people online and I wait there for five, 10 minutes and it's barely moved because it's taking so long to check people out yeah. that despite me wanting to buy something from you- You're gonna lose interest. I'm only gonna wait for so long. And unless mm -hmm. you have your shit together where you can quickly check people out and move on to the next person. Yeah. Cause merch is kind of slow anyways. You know, I need to see this size. Nope, I need to see a different size. Like it only goes so fast. So sometimes you might need more than one person. But get it as efficient as you can because you're more likely to lose sales if you make people wait. Yeah, you can, you can get a, a little card reader, I think for free with like Squarespace. Oh yeah, there's so many you options know, for that stuff now. You can get a little cheap lockbox. You can, you know, so the more easier it is, the more likely people will buy. If they, oh, you don't have your Venmo ready to go and you have to manually type it in on my phone to get it to work, you're going to lose people, you know, have all the things that they might need laid out on a sheet of paper or whatever so that it's just efficient as possible and yeah. Yeah, and have signs up so that people can actually see stuff from far away. So they, they know yeah. what they want when they get up to the table, if they are waiting for a line, that they can actually make up their minds. They know what mm -hmm. anything costs, they know what's available, and now they just have to order it. You have to process that transaction and that's that. Yeah. One other thing to keep in mind is just, there's other bands or other artists at the show there might be a limited area for merch. You don't need to take up the whole space. Be aware of, all right, other people might, you know, need some of this table. There's nothing worse than the opening band taking up the whole table with their 15 shirts. And then everyone else is like, well, where do I set up? So just, that's one of those other things. Be aware, be respectful, keep a small footprint, but. Share. Sharing yeah. is caring, people. Okay, th there's one other thing on the merch thing because I, I don't see this very often. If you are selling more than one thing, then you should have some sort of deal for buying more than one thing. Everyone else pretty much has figured this out. Every other industry of like, yeah. give a discount, an incentive of some sort to buy more stuff. If you only have one thing, I mean, you could even have like, hey, if you want to buy two t-shirts, it costs $1 less. It doesn't have to be huge, but just something. Give yeah. some incentive in the world so that there's a little bit of, you know what? Actually, me and my friend both want shirts now because yeah. we can save a little bit of money if we do it together. Particularly if you have a lot of merch, now you can make all kinds of different bundles. 
vinyl and a t-shirt. You get it for this price, just vinyl. No, it's this price. You see this, but not as often as it should just be. You always do it. Mm. You will make more money. You don't have to make, have huge, like buy one, get one free or anything yeah, like that. But, but buy one, get one, five bucks off. Yeah. Buy one. Yeah. And have little freebie things, have stickers that you just give with a purchase, little extra thing you can throw in there. It just helps and people enjoy that and, and get a lot out of it. If you are the singer, for instance, and you're running the merch booth, some people are going to come just to hang out and talk. So you need to have a, a backup plan because that's an important part. You know, you want to be meeting your fans and hanging out. But if that becomes more and more successful, you're also messing up your merch because you, yeah. you can't sell as much. You should still be there to get people to the booth, but then have a friend, have another bandmate, have somebody that can yeah. help actually process things and move things along so that you aren't stalling everybody out. Because remember, the longer you wait, the more people on the back are just going to peel off and not buy anything. Yeah. You can have the merch person be at the beginning of the conveyor belt. And then if you're the singer or whatever, you're off to the side. So that, and that merch person can kind of be like, all right, thanks for coming. What would you like? All right. Now you can go meet blah, blah, blah take a picture with them over here, you know, and they can be kind of the person that keeps things moving yeah. and they can be the person that can kind of push people along if they're staying around too long or whatever. And that way it's not on you to be the bad guy. Like, Oh, we got to move on to the next person. Or they can kind of be that little conveyor belt that helps move it along efficiently. I like the use of conveyor belt, Max. <laughs> uh, all right, let's get on to our last big mistake. Our last category is the loadout. Now, it's similar to load in, but it's actually different in some ways. The first thing is a lot of times people take too long with this and the venue is annoyed that you and your and your groupies are hanging out past when they wanted to close. So just yeah. be really conscious of when you need to be out of the venue. Yeah, be conscious and then divide up roles. The singer is probably going to be the person out there still talking to fans, still meeting people, taking pictures at the merch table. Fine, that's good. Everyone else, swallow the ego and go pick a job. X person is in charge of getting this gear or these things in the cases and back into the car or in the van. This person is in charge of this thing, taking care of this thing. Because otherwise you'll just lose things. You'll misplace things. If you're, if you're backlining gear, make sure you get your gear back. If you lent out cables or whatever, make sure you have like a little piece of red tape or whatever on your cables so that you know that they're yours and you get them back. Have a little checklist of these are all the things that we brought. These are all the things that we need to get back into these cases or whatever. And just have a little system and you'll, it'll be efficient. You'll be tired and kind of worn out after the show. Last thing you want to do is like have to really think about, oh, did we get everything? If you just have kind of a mindless checklist, it'll kind of help you get everything torn down, everything in the right place. You have everything back, you have that peace of mind, and you can kind of get out of there. Yeah, I think when it comes to loadout, it's probably the best system is that everybody packs up their own gear, simply because then you know you've got what you came with. Yeah. You know, somebody's helping, once you've got it packed into its cases or whatever, everything's put away, people are going to help haul it out, sure. Mm -hmm. But I think getting stuff into cases and back in, like, that's the quickest way to have things lost or stolen is yeah. when you're relying on somebody else to pack up your pedal board or wrap your cables up for you. Like you got to put all that stuff away yourself so you know where it was mm -hmm. and then ideally haul it out. But there are multiple things that need to happen. If everybody in the band is packing up their gear and maybe the singer doesn't have gear, then they can be the one to go collect payment from the venue, maybe help close any tabs if there's a band tab open, making sure all of that's taken care of packing up the merch booth. People can divide up gear. You know, the drummer might have the most amount of gear. Maybe a, a bass player, a keyboard player is done early and then they can also help with merch or whatever. But pack up your stuff individually and then if you want to load it out as a group, that's fine. But again, help. Mm -hmm. Help. Be Know when you need to be out by. Make sure you close up with the, the staff. Tip them well. Thank them. Be kind and get out on time. Yeah, they... They're there all the time. They're doing shows all the time. They don't want to be there until two, three in the morning. You know, get your stuff, get out, thank them, do one last check over, make sure you got everything, and then end it on a good note. If you end it on, there's one more person at the venue waiting for you to leave. They're going to be pissed off. And it's just like, just get out, be efficient, leave with a good taste 
in their mouth that you know they enjoyed working with you and, and it ended on a good note don't end it on god i this band needs to get out of here it's two in the morning yeah one common thing is you know like girlfriends boyfriends are hanging out afterwards and sometimes venues get super annoyed by that yeah so just again like be aware everyone needs to get out if you're not with the band get out like i've heard that a hundred times yeah it's like then listen to that they're angry <laughs> get the people out say hey we'll go meet you at this bar down here at this show just appease them don't piss them off and quite honestly the the smaller that group is the more likely you will not lose your stuff in the loadout <laughs> cuz i've definitely had that happen a few times with bandmates of mine having lost expensive pieces of gear because they just assumed somebody else packed it up for them yeah yeah all right cool well thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode if you like it please give it a thumbs up share it with a friend go over to youtube and hit subscribe all of that matters a lot to us we really appreciate uh hearing from everybody our contact info is in the show notes so if you have feedback if you want to suggest another topic, if you want to add to this conversation, let us know and we'll try to include it somewhere else. That's it for now. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time.